Let me see if it's lagging now. It looks like it's good. All right, so section 3.4. Now, I don't know if there's going to be A or not, like if there's going to be an A, B, but uh, we'll see. So this is called concavity. And the second derivative test. So concavity and the second derivative test. Now here's the nice thing about concavity. It's basically just another derivative. We're just gonna take a derivative again, okay? You know how to do this already. I'm taking a derivative, so we're just gonna do it again. And after you do it again, you're still gonna solve for it uh, by setting it equal to zero or making it undefined. Find those numbers. You're still gonna make a sine graph. You're still gonna check for positive and negatives, but the only difference is when you do the second derivative and you do all the work you're used to doing already, um, those pluses and minuses do not mean increasing or decreasing. The only difference is that a minus means that it's concave down, a plus means that it's concave up. And that's it. That's the only difference. Okay, definition. All right. Uh, remember I told you guys we take almost half a year talking about um, derivatives and the other half year talking about the antiderivative, the integral, right? Because derivatives have so many uses. They do so many things. So um, a derivative can mean slopes, it can mean rates of change, it can mean increasing, decreasing, concavity, like I said right here, related rates, it can mean optimization, it can mean a whole bunch of stuff. So you have to kind of learn the de definitions for it. So anyway, uh, like I said, we, we're going to talk about concavity. Now, um, if you're not sure what concavity is, uh, I'll draw you a, a quick little picture here. Anything that's concave up or concave down. Now you guys actually see concavity every time you go to a movie theater. You guys ever notice how the screens are kind of like bowed? Right, that's concave, okay, that's a, that's a concavity right there. So um, concave up means that the graph will look like this, okay? Concave down means the graph will look like this. That's all it basically means. Okay, so that's the only like difference. Literally, that's the only difference of what you're doing. And you're just gonna apply that to those skeleton curves that I referred to, right? Those, those, uh, those sign graphs that we do at first. You're gonna try to figure out, okay, this is what it looks like. So here's how you do the test for concavity, okay? So this is a theorem. And then we'll get into some, uh, some examples. So theorem 3.7, test for concavity. So it says, let f be a function whose second derivative exists on uh, an open interval i. Remember, they're just basically saying, look, we, we want there to be a second derivative because if the second derivative doesn't exist, then there is no concavity, okay? So um, an example of this, if you guys can imagine this, is just think of a normal linear function like y equals x. The first derivative for y equals x is one, right? But then you take another derivative of one, your answer is zero, right? <laughs> Think of a straight line, it has no curvature to it, right? So um, something like that would mean, you know, there's no concavity to it. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that right now. But um, again, just let f be a function whose second derivative exists on an open interval i, okay? Now there's three situations that could occur. So number one, if you find that the second derivative is greater than zero, okay, for all x in i, okay? What that basically means is you tested some numbers and you found out that the value of your second derivative is actually positive, then the graph is concave up. OK, 
okay if the second derivative is less than zero for all x in i in other words for all the values within the interval then the graph is concave down So if your second derivative values, not your actual second derivative, okay, so because your second derivative is going to look like an expression, right, it's, it's going to be a function. But if you start plugging into that function, any numbers, and you start saying like, oh, at this number it's positive, so right there it's going to have upward concavity. Uh, as you're plugging in numbers uh, and find that it's less than zero, okay, you're plugging in things and you're finding out that the answers are negative, then you're going to say it's concave down, okay. Uh, if your second derivative is equal to zero, okay, then the graph is linear. So I just talked about that right now, right? I just said, think about the function f of x equal to x. The first derivative is 1, but the second derivative of that, right, is 0. The derivative of 1 is 0. So it says if the second derivative is 0, then the graph is linear. Okay, so that's how you know whether or not a graph is going to be a straight line. I mean, you should know that before. If you see a, a function like uh, f of x equals to x minus 7, then you should know it's a line. Uh, but if you didn't, uh, for some reason, then... Um, uh, you could figure it out by taking two derivatives, okay? Um, just a real quick note for us here. A straight line has no concavity. There's no curvature to it, or else it wouldn't be a straight line. It'd be called a curve. Okay, so straight line has no concavity. That's why every linear function, uh, you're going to notice that um, when you're doing it, you always get a zero for a second derivative because there's no curvature to it. So remember, uh, an easy way to put this into less words. You're going to take two derivatives and then you're going you're gonna to make a sine graph for the second derivative. Okay, and if the values that you plug in come out positive, then it's concave up. If they're negative, it's concave down. If it's zero, then the function's linear. Okay, so let me show you how we're going to do this. So example number one. Um, we're going to determine where f of x equal to x cubed minus 2x uh, a is increasing or decreasing and b is concave up or down Okay, now notice, uh, to figure out where it's increasing or decreasing, concave up or down, I'm just going to basically, I, I see that my goal is to get to a second derivative, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do all my work all the way through before I answer any of these questions. So, f of x is x cubed minus 2x. Now, I know i got to go all the way up to a second derivative because they're talking about concavity. So, let's just do the first derivative here f prime of x, that's 3x squared minus 2. Okay, so there's my first derivative. I can't factor anything from it, so I'm not going to do anything like that. Um, but I can take my second derivative now, f double prime of x. So 3x squared will become a 6x. And then minus 2, well, that becomes a 0. So there's my second derivative. Okay? So I just, I just took both derivatives at once. 
Okay, now let's go ahead and figure out my critical numbers for my first derivative. So 3x squared minus 2 equals 0. That means 3x squared equals 2, or x squared equals 2 thirds, or x is equal to plus or minus radical 2 thirds. Now, I'm going to do the same thing for my second derivative because in order to find out where it's concave up or down, I got to check for positive and negative values, right? So let's set 6x equal to 0. That means x equals 0. Now, this is two separate pieces of work. So I'm going to do my sign graphs separately. They're not all being done at the same time, okay? So let's do my first derivative sign graph. All right. So I know I need to have one at negative radical two thirds and one at positive radical two thirds. Okay, I'm gonna get my calculator out really quick because what is radical two thirds? So I'm just gonna do this on my phone really quick. But um, let's see, square root two thirds is a 0 0.816, so uh, 0 0.8. So that means that I can use uh, a one that would be bigger than it, okay? So um, a one is gonna be over here, right? I'm just gonna write it in highlighter, I'll get rid of it. I'll test a zero in here, and then I'll test a negative one over there, okay? Those are gonna be the numbers I'm gonna test. I'm gonna erase them because I don't want them to be there, but I just want you guys to know those are the ones I'm gonna try out, okay? So I will show the work over here on the side, like scratch work like we did last time. Okay, so here we go. F prime of negative one. Okay, so if I plug in negative one into my derivative, it's three times negative one squared minus two. So that's three minus two. So that's one, that means it's positive. So this function is increasing at that point. Now let me try a zero, f prime of zero. So again, the function I'm plugging into is this one right there, okay, three x squared minus two, that's my derivative. Okay, so I'm plugging it into there. So three times zero squared minus two, that's negative two, so that's negative. And now I'll plug in f of one, or f prime of one. f prime of one is three times one squared minus two. Well, that's also a one, so that's positive. Okay, so according to my sine graph, my function's going up, then down, and then up. Now, I'm not gonna answer the I'm not going to answer the uh, questions of where is it increasing or decreasing yet, okay? I know, I know right now where it's happening. Uh, it's increasing from negative infinity to negative rad 2 over 3 and also from rad 2 over 3 to positive infinity. That's where it's increasing. It's decreasing from negative rad 2 over 3 to positive rad 2 over 3. I can see that, okay? I know the answers, but I'm not going to write them down, okay? Let me draw the second derivative sine graph. It's always nice to put them near each other if you're going to have to do both. Try your best to make them match up so that your numbers make sense. Okay, so zero would be right about here, even on the graph above. That's about where zero would be. So I'm trying my best to make them match up. Okay, so I'm going to plug in some numbers into my second derivative to check concavity. I'm going to try negative 1 and 1, since those are numbers to the left and right of 0. So again, I'm going to do a little bit of a scratch work over here. I'm going to do on the left side. So f double prime of negative 1. Again, I'm going to plug that into this equation right there, my second derivative, okay, 6x. All right. So that's six times negative one, which is negative six, which means this is negative. Okay, 
Now I'm going to plug in a 1. So second derivative at 1, that's 6 times 1, that's 6. So this would be positive. So all I'm going to do is make either a happy face or a sad face, okay? So right here, it's sad. And over here, it's happy. In other words, it's concave down and then it's concave up. Now, before I move on, do we have any questions? Have you guys noticed that I've just done the same work, but twice? Right? I didn't do anything new. Just the definition change for the second derivative. That's all. Okay? The second derivative now means that you're checking for concavity. All right? So, let's list the information that they want. Part A. They say... Where is it increasing? Where is it decreasing? So based on my first derivative sine graph, it's increasing from negative infinity to negative radical two-thirds. Okay, or, so you can use a union if you want to. Okay, that little horseshoe. That means or, or you can write or from radical two-thirds to positive infinity. That's where it's increasing. I can see that on the first, the first sign graph, okay? It's right here. Increasing there, increasing there. It's going up. Now it's decreasing right here, right in the middle. So let me write that down. This is decreasing. from negative radical two-thirds to positive radical two-thirds. Any questions on that part? And you're just using your drawings, okay? You don't have to do anything special. Just hopefully your drawings are correct so that you can answer these questions fairly simply. They're not going to take a long time to do. Part B, we're just using the second picture. It says, where is it concave up? Well, it's concave up when it's smiling, right? So it's going to be from zero to positive infinity. Okay. And then it's going to be concave down. Well, when it's not happy, right? When it's sad. So negative infinity to zero. Now, if I were to graph this thing, okay, based on my skeleton graph, so right now I'm going to kind of mess with this function. So don't do this on yours, okay? Um, but let me just do this really quick. If I had to graph what this kind of looks like based on my skeleton graph only and my concavity stuff, I know that my zero is somewhere around here, right? So that means that this graph should look like this. Now, why do I know it curves that way? Well, because it tells me that up until zero, this thing should be looping downwards, right? So you can see that I'm going up and then back down, up to zero, but I'm looping downwards, so that's concave down. And then it says after zero, this graph should now loop upwards. So then I'm going to follow my skeleton graph and do this. And if you were to graph this function, I'm pretty sure it's going to look something like that. Okay, where is it exactly? What points? Well, I don't know yet. I haven't done that calculation. But, but I can tell you that it's going to look similar to what I did right there with the green highlighter. Okay, just based on those two little pictures that I drew, I can give you a really good sketch. Now, as to being precise, that's a whole different story. At that point, I'd have to plug in zero 
into my function because I want to figure out where the point zero is. I'd have to plug in radical two-thirds into my, fa my function and negative radical two-thirds into my original function. So I can find actual coordinates of where these high points and low points are occurring. So then I can draw a nice sketch. Okay, but right now, uh, the way that highlighter is, that's the way it's supposed to look. Okay, maybe it doesn't loop that much, maybe it loops a lot more. I have no idea, okay, until I actually find some concrete numbers. But for now, that's what my, my uh, two little sketches help me do, my sign graphs. Okay, any questions on this? Anything uh, didn't make sense? And I do want to repeat to you guys, we are doing the same thing just twice, okay? And we're changing the definition of, sec uh, of the derivative, the second derivative from, from increasing, decreasing to concavity, either up or down. I didn't do anything different. The derivative rules don't change. The uh, product rule doesn't become different. The, the quotient rule doesn't become different. The chain rule doesn't change, right? Uh, it's all the same. Everything is identical to what you've learned so far. You're just doing it again. And you're giving it a different definition now. Now it's concavity. It's not increasing or decreasing. Okay? So, um, that's what they want you guys to be able to do uh, at, that, at that point. Now, the point zero for this function. So you guys see this little uh, point zero right here. Okay? That point zero, we're going to call it a point of inflection. Okay? So let's, let's do that. So a point of inflection. Now remember how I told you guys that all we're doing is changing definitions, right? So when you take your first derivative, so let's look back up here again. I'll try to keep that word uh, visible to you guys. But when we did our first derivative, we noticed that the signs go from uh, plus to minus to plus. You guys see that, right? First derivative sign graph, plus, minus, plus. When that happens, these critical numbers, they graduate to being called what? Critical, instead of critical, yeah, critical points, right? And then we call them extrema, right? They get a different name. Well, the same happens with your second derivative. If it changes from minus to plus or from plus to minus, on the second derivative, we call it a point of inflection. In other words, this is when the concavity changes inflection from being facing down to facing up, okay? So that's all that a point of inflection is, okay? It's the point where concavity changes. Okay? So it's the point where concavity changes. Now there's a theorem for this. So theorem 3.8. And this theorem might sound familiar. Let's see if you guys can tell me what it's kind of referring to. It says points of inflection. Is if c comma f of c, by the way, that's just x comma y, all right? But that's the way they write it, right? Because if your point is x, then f of x would be y, right? So c comma f of c, that's just a point, normal point, okay? I know it looks different, but it's normal. So if this is a point of inflection, Uh, of the graph F, then either F double prime of C equals zero or F double prime of C is undefined. 
So does this definition, does this theorem remind you of another theorem to something we've already done? Critical what? We have critical numbers or critical points, right? Critical points, the definition of a critical point was that their first derivative was equal to zero or the first derivative was undefined. So notice all I'm doing is saying, well, hey, same thing, just do another derivative. Again, I'm not changing main definitions. They're still the same, just that now we're saying, okay, this also applies to your second derivative too. And we're just going to call it, instead of a critical point, we're going to call it a point of inflection, right? So this is what I've been kind of telling you over and over in this lesson. It's all the same thing. You're just doing it one more time, right? And the definitions change, of course, right? We're not going to say it's increasing or decreasing twice. Um, so we call it a, a concavity for the second derivative. And then we don't call it a critical point again. We call it a point of inflection, right? So that's the only thing. So let's do one more example here. Or we'll do like a really quick example, and then we'll do one extra one, okay? So example number two. Find the point of inflection. And of course, if it exists. Okay, so um, because not everything's going to have concavity. Like we said, linear functions don't, right? So if it exists. So here's the first one. f of x equals to x to the sixth. Okay. So... What do I need to do to show that something is a point of inflection? Take the derivative twice. So let's do the first one. f prime of x is 6x to the fifth. Do I have to make a sign graph for this if all they want to know is a point of inflection? No, who cares about the sign graph? I don't care if it's going up or down. All I care about is does concavity change, right? So we got the first derivative. Let's go straight to the second one. This will be 30x to the fourth. Okay. All right, awesome. So what am I supposed to do to find this point of inflection? Set it equal to zero. 30x to the fourth equals zero, which means x to the fourth equals zero, which means that x is equal to plus or minus zero which is impossible, so uh, x is just zero, right? All right, so is that my point of inflection or do I have to check anything? What's the definition of point of inflection? Look back at it. Not the theorem, but the, actual, the definition I gave you. What does it say? Go ahead. Um, you have to check if concavity changes. Yeah, we got to check if concavity changes. Just because we set uh, something equal to zero and solve doesn't mean that that's a point of inflection. That just means that's an interesting number. That's a critical number again, right? Like, I should pay attention to this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a sign graph for my second derivative with zero as the focus. Now I'll plug in negative one and one into my second derivative. So f double prime of negative one, f double prime of one. And what I'm hoping to find is that maybe it'll be minus plus or plus minus, then that'll prove that it's a point of inflection. But if it's minus minus and plus plus, what does that tell me? It's not a point of inflection, there's no change. Right? So let's plug in a negative 1 into my second derivative, which is 30x to the fourth. So 30, negative 1 to the fourth, that's just 30, so positive. And 30 times 1 to the fourth is also just 30, so that's just positive. So does this have a point of inflection? No. A point of inflection. 
does not exist for f of x. And most likely, x to the 6 looks like this. So, because notice it's just saying up, so that means it's probably just concave up. You guys know like x squared, x, so like x squared functions look like this, x to the 4th, they look like this, x to the 6th, they literally look at that, x to the 8th, they're even more flat, okay? Any even power gets more and more flat. Okay, um, so just FYI, all right. Um, so, all right, let's try B, and then we'll be done. I think I think we can do B, right? Okay, yeah, we should be able to. So, part B. Um, F of x equals x to the fourth minus four x cubed. And then we'll do a second derivative test on Monday, uh, which is a really good one. Um, but uh, for now, we'll just stop here. So let's take our derivatives, right? And I got to do them just both at the same right away because I don't need to do is it going up, is it going down, increasing, decreasing. Who cares? I'm looking for points of inflection, okay? So first derivative is important because I need to know what it is. It would be 4x cubed minus 12x squared. But then other than that, I don't need to solve for anything. If you want to, go ahead for extra practice, but you don't need to do anything with it. F double prime of x is equal to 12x squared minus 24x. So there's my second derivative. Now, I always factor because I'm going to have to solve for x. So um, there's my factored form, 12x times x minus 2. And I'm going to set that equal to 0. So that means that 12x is 0, or x minus 2 equals 0, right? So my two answers would be 0 and 2. But remember, that doesn't guarantee that these are points of inflection. That just tells me those are interesting points, right? Those are points of interest, right, that, that I'm going to kind of uh, test out and see. So I need my second derivative sine graph. Remember, this is not an actual sine graph. It's just a graph that we put symbols on, right? Plus and minus, so sines, S-I-G-N, right? Um, so um, what number should I plug in first to check? Give me one. Negative one. F double prime of negative one. So that's going into my second derivative. Um, I'm going to plug it into this one. By the way, I always recommend you plug your numbers into your um, factored form because sometimes it's easier to do it in your head with the factored ones. So um, 12 times negative 1 is negative, and then negative 1 minus 2 is negative. So they're both negative. So negative times a negative is a positive. So that's plus. Now what should I plug in? A 1, all right, f double prime of 1. So let's plug in a 1 into that factored form. 12 times 1, that's positive. 1 minus 2, that's negative. A positive times a negative, that's a negative. So is 0 a point of inflection? Yes, it is, right? What do I plug in next? 3, okay. And remember, you can plug in any number, 2.5, 2.01, whatever you want, but... Try sticking with integers, usually it makes it easier. You plug in a 3, 12 times 3, that's positive. 3 minus 2, positive. So positive times positive is a positive. Is 2 a point of inflection? Yeah. So um, I'm going to put uh, for my answer the point of inflection are 0 comma and 2 comma but I gotta figure out what those points are right so what do I do what do I do with that 0 plug it into what into the original function f of 0 would be 
Uh, that'd be 0 to the 4th minus 4 times 0 to the 3rd, which is 0. So that answer right here would be 0, 0. And then I got to do f of 2. So 2 to the 4th minus 4 times 2 to the 3rd. That's 16 minus 4 times 8. Is that right? Yeah, 8, right? Um, so that's going to be uh, 16 minus 32, which is negative 16. So I'm going to put that right there. And there you go. Here's my answer. So we'll stop there.